recording. And um, let me just share my screen just so we have something to look at in the recording other than just the default paper button screen. Um, here we go. All right. So um, if you haven't already signed in, please do. Today is our first um, meeting at our new time for the combined teaching and learning and UX groups. So we had talked about this um, in previous meetings. Uh, so if, 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 you, uh, if you don't recall, the UX group would typically meet on the same Wednesdays as teaching and learning, but later in the afternoon. Um, so that, that time had moved around a little bit. Originally, it was right after the teaching and learning. Um, and then later they moved uh, to 2 p.m. But um, the folks that were leading that group um, had to step away. And um, there were still some attendees that liked to, to go to that, but they couldn't make it at the 10 a.m. time slot where um, teaching and learning used to meet. So what we did is we did a kind of switch o change o We shifted teaching and learning an hour later so that some of our West Coast folks could join and we combined it with the UX group um, because there is quite a lot of overlap um, in some of the, the JIRAs and some of the topics that both groups um, discuss or take a look at. And, um, and also we were hoping that um, because the UX group had kind of dwindled over time, there was only a few people that would regularly attend. Um, we were hoping that combining both groups would give a a better pool of people to uh, to be kind of regular attendees at the combined meeting. So, so that's kind of where we are today. And um, I thought we would just do uh, a couple quick announcements and then um, take a look at uh, some of our upcoming meetings to just sort of plan those out. Usually we wait that for that until the very end, but I thought we'd flip the order today to kind of get that out of the way. And then we can go and look at a few JIRAs. Um, so, um, as far as announcements go, we do have our, uh, fourth quarter Sakai PMC meeting next week. It will be from 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. in Big Blue Button Room 4. That's the time and the location where the core team call usually happens. So if you typically attend the core team call, you can just go to your usual place on Tuesday mornings. But, um... For those of you who don't normally attend the core team, you're welcome to attend the PMC meeting if you like. Um, there is an agenda, which I neglected to paste in there. I'll, I'll go grab that URL in just a moment and paste it in. Um, but uh, feel free to add items to the agenda if you would like. And again, it's open to everyone, um, regardless of whether or not you're a, a PMC member. Um, we also have uh, all the recordings from the virtual conference available. So if you missed the conference or if you would like to go back and maybe catch a session or two that conflicted or um, you'd like to review again, all of those recordings are available at the link to the playlist there in the Etherpad. Um, so that is... Uh, the playlist of all the sessions that were recorded. We didn't record like the games and stuff, but all of the presentation sessions were recorded. So, um, oh, and Josh mentions that he's going to be posting some highlights on social media as well. So he's going to be pulling out little 30 to minute long segments um, to post on social media to kind of highlight some key concepts. 30 seconds, he says. Okay. <laughs> Did I say minutes? I meant second. I meant 30 seconds to a minute. It probably didn't come out that way. So anyway, <laughs> <laughs> forgive me as I babble. Um, all right. So uh, does anybody else have any announcements that they would like to share at this point? Wilma, I have a question. Do we want to mention the, uh, the Sakai camp poll in this venue? Oh yeah, oh, yeah, that's a that's good, good, good idea. So I can't pull. Oh, let me go find that URL as well. It's somewhere in my email. So if um, if those of you who have attended Sakai Camp in the past 
would um, be interested in potentially going again or people who maybe haven't been and would like to go. It's our annual um, planning retreat. We do kind of strategic planning and also some team building. Um, the face-to-face -face Sakai camps have not happened for a while since um, since COVID, basically. So our last one was in uh, 2020, right before lockdown, the first time around. So this would be our first um, in-person official Sakai camp. We've done a virtual version of it the last couple years. Um, so, uh, so we're planning to, well, there still will be a hybrid version of, of attending, but it won't be for the entire meeting, obviously. Um, so we'll have the ability for people to connect remotely if they're not going to be there um, in person. But for those who would like to come in person, um, we're looking at different locations and different weeks in January and early February for the meeting. So if you would like to express your preferences over the, you know, the timing of the event and the location, um, if you, particularly if you plan to come in person, please fill out that poll. And we're going to be talking about the results from the poll at the PMC meeting to kind of make a decision. Um, but, uh, but we'd like to get input from as many folks as possible. So even if you're not planning to go in person, but you want to attend virtually, go ahead and fill it out and let us know that you're um, not going to be attending, but you might have a preference as to which week we do the meeting. So, um, so please do fill that out. And Josh mentions consider coming in person if your schedule allows. There may be some support for travel costs from commercial affiliates. So if you um, would like to come, but your budget doesn't really have room for that, um, you know, if you let us know, we might be able to do something from the affiliates um, area. Dee Dee says me, me, me. <laughs> so yeah, please, please let us know. There's a place of, for comments in the form, but if you've already filled it out and you didn't comment, you can just reach out to me or Josh or Dr. Chuck um, and let us know, and we'll be happy to, to connect you with the right folks to see about any type of travel assistance. Um, okay, any other announcements? Okay. Um, all right, so we, uh, we have our planning coming up for our upcoming meetings. And I thought it would make sense to do that because um, not only are we planning kind of a, a slightly different agenda because it's the two combined groups, but we have some holidays and um, different dates coming up soon. So I thought it would make sense to kind of plan those out now. So our next meeting, if we follow our normal pattern, would be um, the third week of December, which is December 21st. Um, is that a date where folks will be around? I know a lot of people, um, their institutions may be on uh, winter break or something by then. So, um, so I'm interested to see if, if you guys want to meet that week or not. Um, if not, then today would be our last meeting of the calendar year. and We could pick back up in January. But if enough people are going to be around on the 21st, we can certainly meet. So maybe you can let me know in the chat if you want to meet or not. Okay, Jeremy says yes. Jordan says yes. Okay, Christina says yes. All right, it looks like a good number of folks can meet. So we will definitely um, hold our meeting on. Yes, we will meet that day. All right. Um, so what about January 4th? That is the week um, that, again, it's, we usually meet first and third Wednesdays. So that's the week right after um, the New Year holiday. Will people be back on campus by that day? So just let me know. And yeah, it might be the first week of class for some of you, which would be difficult for other reasons. So yes or no on January 4th. Okay, Jennifer says it's first day back. Um, a lot of people return on the 3rd. 
I'm thinking that might be a, a meeting we we skip because it, a lot of a lot of folks are going to be just hitting the ground um, with classes starting, so it might be a little hectic. Yeah. Why don't we skip? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Um, I, I mean, everybody will be getting back. We're going to all be answering those emails of the time that happened you know, while everyone's prepping for their, you know, uh, faculty who are reaching out because Christmas morning they were needed to, you know, work on their classes and we weren't available to answer their question that day, so. Okay, great. So we'll plan to skip the fourth. So after the 21st, then our first meeting will be potentially the 18th if it doesn't fall on Sakai Camp. Um, so the week of the 18th, I believe, is one of the weeks we were looking at. It is. It? it is. It is. It's one yeah. of them. Yeah. And um, I don't. I didn't see the form feedback, but I know we're looking at the next week as well. Um, and I think there was a third option at the beginning of February. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was the the week or the sixth through the tenth. I think was one of the options. Exactly. So. Um, I would say, you know, it's basis on Sky Camp or. Yeah. Let's plan to meet on the 18th. And if we need to cancel, we can. Okay. But since we don't know when Sakai Camp is going to happen or if there will be a kind of a hybrid connection during our meeting time, which maybe not. Because um, the people that come in person will be there all day, but people connecting virtually may or may not connect all day. So, um, so we'll, we'll go ahead and plan to meet on Sakai Camp and how that works out. So we'll, we'll play it by ear a little bit. Okay. Um, now in terms of agenda, I, I'd love to get some ideas from you folks for potential um, topics to, to cover during the 21st or the 18th. Um, I know in the past, we've sometimes had um, people who maybe presented at um, either Open Aperio or the virtual conference or even SakaiCon, um, where maybe they did a shorter presentation or a lightning talk to come back and talk about their topic in more detail. So that's certainly an option. If you're looking for some inspiration, we can look at some of the um, recordings on the playlist and see if there's anybody we want to invite back to um, do a little deeper dive. Let me, let me open up the playlist and just see. Wilma, could I come back at some point for some follow-up on the roadmap? Sure. But, uh, I'd like to get some more input. Um, yeah. Probably not until after the first of the year, I would think. Okay, so you want to put that down for the 18th then? Yeah, depending on Sakai Camp, and I may have to go to Texas Tech that week. So right. Depending and depending, Gosh. but yeah. Roadmap. Oops, can't spell. Roadmap. And camp and okay. Other ideas? Yes, we have an idea in the chat. We think a Sakai Girl escape room might be a lot of fun for everyone to learn. Uh -huh. play with. And okay. Christina and I typed it at the exact same time. It's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so would you like to do that in December or January? Why don't we take a poll of the people on the call and see who would like to give that a try and, and when? Yeah. Well, I see a couple of people saying December. It'd be a fun holiday thing. Fun before break. Okay. Why don't we do Tiger Escape Room on the 24th or 21st? And Wilma, so, it seems that Jennifer wants to create one. Ah, okay. Um, I don't know that we'll have time to both play and create one um, during the same session, but we could certainly do a follow up to, um, you know, kind of work on setting one up. So why don't we play it through first so everybody kind of gets an idea of what it 
what the experience is like. And then maybe we can have a follow up meeting in January or February where we actually um, start building one. How's that sound? I like that idea and maybe we could um, be sure to invite those who are um, who are interested as well. Okay. So I'm going to see, I don't want to put too much on the 18th because we might have to move that meeting anyway. So let's see what I meant next. like for the 21st and stuff too. make sure that we invite Sangyu. Yeah. yeah, invite. Let's yeah, I had sent, I don't know if you guys saw it on the email list. I had sent a poll around to find a day to, to do the escape room again. Um, and uh, not a whole lot of people filled out the poll. We only had three and, and you guys had all different dates <laughs> selected. Um, yeah, it's so, the first time you ever do that and you can't match any schedules. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't, I mean, there were no two that matched. So I'm like, okay, well, can we combine these at all? <laughs> um, so if we're gonna do the one on, on the 21st, Didi, you are one of my poll filler outers. Um, Jennifer, can you make the 21st um, Sakaiger escape room? You were one of the other ones. Yes, I think yes. so. Okay. So yeah, I can come to the one that's at 11, the one we're going to have. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so San Young is the only other person who filled out the poll. So I'll get with her and make sure she knows about that date. Um, and I, I might offer it again if enough people are interested. So I'll see if she can make that date. If she can't, then I'll schedule one at the at the time that she liked and invite anybody else who's available to, to join us. Um, but if you're planning to come on the 21st, then um, you probably want to save it for the 21st because once you've played it through, you already know all the puzzles. So it's kind of like a spoiler. You can help give hints to people who've not played it, which is, which is also somewhat entertaining <laughs> having done that a couple times myself. Okay. Um, but, uh, but you don't want to spoil it for folks. You want to make them work for it. So, um, all right. So let me look at the next date we would hold in February, which would be the first, February 1st. So February 1st, maybe we can do a follow-up. Um, 30, getting started building escape room. And what I might do is give you guys some homework to bring stuff. It's a lot of the time spent building something like that is finding all the, the media that you want to put into it. So maybe if you can bring a few things with you to get started with, then that'll make it a little quicker for folks to get going. So, okay, I like that idea. So do we have any other um, thoughts of um, things that people would like to see at a future session? These have all been very teaching and learning oriented. I don't know if, if there's folks who typically attend the UX call, um, if there's anything that you guys would like to see from a UX perspective for us to focus on. Is there anything uh, in terms of uh, questions or feedback around the, the Trinity deployment that this group needs to either be aware of or weigh in on? I think we took a look at Trinity um, a few weeks or a few months, maybe. I forget exactly when we looked at it. I know we looked at it one session, um, but we could certainly use another look now that it's had more work done to get additional feedback. So maybe we could devote one of our meetings to um, to some Trinity feedback. Does that sound good? Maybe February fifteenth, uh, which will be our next Wednesday. Trinity 
You know what else would be kind of fun or, or festive, as an old mentor of mine used to say? Um, I wonder if this group has had a chance to really go through that list of, of uh, potential reports from a learning analytics perspective that you put together. Right, the, the data analytics, the types of reporting. Right. Right, so we can do March for that. And these are all tentative. We can shift them around. If people want to do them earlier, we can decide in between now and March to move it up or back. Okay, so March 1st is the first Wednesday. So Sakai Analytics. Okay. Cool. That's great. Yeah, it's always good to have an agenda. I mean, we can default to Jirapalooza, which is what we do when we don't have an agenda. <laughs> but um, but it's and we nice have to a have lot of that too. But still, yeah, yeah, and we'll work in some some uh, additional um, Jiras at the end of each um, session, even if we do have a topic that day. So. Um, we'll try to reserve at least, you know, 15 minutes or so to go over um, a few JIRAs. And these feel free to add both UX related or teaching and learning JIRAs to this list because, again, it's, it's a combined group. So we want to make sure that we give both groups an equal um, opportunity to, to get feedback and share information. Um, so, all right. So it looks like we've mapped out. Through March, anyway, the beginning of March. Um, if anybody has any additional thoughts on topics that you would like to um, suggest for future meetings, please feel free to add those to the agenda. I'll put in another bullet here so you can, if something. Okay, so if you have any brainstorms and you want to add it on there, feel free to to plug in additional topics there. And again, we can move them around on the date depending on what else is scheduled for that day. But if there's like a particular person you want to invite to come back and do a presentation or maybe a, a topic that you'd like for this group to cover, please add those. All right. Um, any other thoughts on our upcoming meeting schedule before we move on? All right, so let's go ahead and move on to some Jira review. Um, so there were a couple that were requested by the um, the Spanish folks, and I, I have a feeling we're going to see a lot more Jira requests from the, the Spanish group because they have that whole list of um, things planned as enhancements. So they may be um, requesting review on a lot of those items. Um, but two of these, I, I believe, come from along that vein. Um, so let's take a look at this first one here. This is uh, using copy from my other sites without content.revise.any permission. So let's see what the description. Okay. So they've created a, a pull request. Um, would anybody like to comment on this one? Use case. I thought I heard something. Yeah. I, what is the use case? I don't. What are they trying to do? Allow anybody to copy? Yeah, I'm not 100% sure. I wish they had provided more detail. In, in the test plan, it looks like they're looking to have someone who's a TA be able to copy content. Ah, okay. <laughs> Yeah, they do a lot with TAs, so I guess they want TAs to be able to copy but not edit. Is that the use, their use case? We'd probably want to get more information about that. Yeah. 
I mean, we, we have um, created our own role called TA All Access. Basically, the only reason for that role is it has everything that an instructor can do, mm -hmm. but it has the TA label so that a student knows that they're not the instructor. That's the, that's the only reason for that label. But um, if they have some other special thing, such as allow this, but don't allow this. Um, and there's another I, question I have on that, Alan. It, thank you for that because that kind of clarified what this looks like to me, but if they're able to copy content, it's from their old courses, which might not be the content that, is, that the student should have access to in the new site, right? Like how are they, it, if they were a TA in an English course and they're just bringing over the wrong stuff, I don't know, it right. kind of makes me feel like they're an instructor role really than a TA. Well, I, some other, uh, services, I guess, um, have like a content manager versus an instructor kind of role, I think. So mm -hmm. I don't know if they're trying to, to seek somebody who might be the equivalent of, um, an instructional designer or something like that, that isn't necessarily labeled as a instructor. And it sounds like they probably have some very special use cases. So maybe we could get some detail on what what these folks should or should not do. And this might align to what Dr. Chuck mentioned in the threads earlier about Sakai Plus and the fact that he's trying to map things to roles that are IMS standards or at least other LMS standards. So this mm -hmm. might be a really good opportunity to, to talk about roles, period, because this group definitely should have a say in discussion about roles because just instructor, TA, and student aren't good enough, I, in my opinion, as far as a base um, set of roles. So that that's a bigger conversation. Maybe that should go on the agenda in the new year. Yeah, I think so. I think that's a great topic. If somebody could add that to the notes, um, I'd appreciate it. Um, yeah, so we definitely would like some more information on this one to understand the use case a little better. Um, so I'll add a comment to that effect. Uh, that we'd like a little more info before we say one way or the other. But I can also mention that some institutions have handled this with roles that are specific to, you know, the particular you know, situation. So it might be labeled as a TA type, but it has more instructor-ish permissions. So I'm not sure why they would want to change it for an existing role, maybe adding a new role is a better approach. So, okay. I'll comment to that effect afterward. So I don't waste a lot of our time typing. Um, let's see, I'll put some quick notes. Need more info. Use case. Let's look at the next one, which is when a group is created on section info, the user who has created the group should be assigned TA automatically. And again, I think this has also to do with their sort of expanded use of TAs. Um, yeah, because if an ins so is this really if a group is created by a TA, then they should be assigned as the TA automatically because, I mean, obviously an instructor shouldn't be listed as the TA. Um, well, the test plan, it does say, here, let me look over and see if they said anything else. When a user, instructor, or teaching assistant, um, this would avoid an extra strap. If she is, he is not interested, they can always delete it. But in our institution, this happens often. Um, I think in if the I comments, recall, in the comments that Zeus and I discussed um, that the automatic adding should only be done for those who have the TA role. So if the instructor creates the section, it works as it currently does. And mm -hmm. if a TA creates the section, TA is automatically added as a group or a member of the group. Yep. Now I can't remember. Does uh, would an instructor have to 
set permissions for the tool to allow TAs to have this kind of functionality in the beginning to even like create the sections, et cetera. I just Not honestly sure can't remember. Is. Yeah, I don't remember what the default is. My guess would be that they would have to be given permission because um, that sounds more like an instructor permission. DD says not in our institution. Well, I'm, I'm logging into yeah, ni nightly in the nightly. background. Um, no, I, I don't want to disrupt. I'll go ahead and do the research in the back end. You guys keep talking. <laughs> okay. Um, oops, that's the wrong one. Okay. So I could see the logic of if the TA is creating this section to go ahead and add the TA. Um, that seems to make sense because why else would the TA be creating sections unless they've just been, sort of been tasked with doing some of the busy work <laughs> for a particular faculty member. Um, I'm not sure what the default permissions are, if, if that's a change as well. So um, I don't know. What do you guys think? Having it automatically assign the TA makes sense to me, but I also don't have too much of an opinion because we never use the TA roles at our institution. Right. It has come up at ours. I mean, where we, it would be nice if the TA was added directly to the groups, but we always run into that issue of, you know, adding the greeting option for a TA ends up being an issue for some reason, but I don't know why it's pretty simple, but their, you know, faculty trip on that. So I think, you know, if they got automatically added um, to a group, it would just be a, a training issue. That's all for the faculty. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like a lot of folks on in this group anyway don't use the TA role very much, at least for section assignment. So, Alan, were you able to check on the default? Or are you still looking? I am still looking. I'm on master, so. Um... He's cooking with gas. We can come back. OK. Yeah. All right, we'll come back. Apparently, the site I, I selected is managed a managed site, so therefore, <laughs> it's not even allowing <laughs> the, uh, the functionality at all. So um, I have to change the, the options here to manually manage. So give me a moment. I'll get there. OK. Um, let's see. The next two Jira's are yours. So I'm going to skip down to Christina's. And then we'll come back. All right, so this one is about lessons. Require that the students submit this assignment for non-electronic assignments should unlock. So Christina, do you want to bring us up to speed a little bit on this one? Sure. Um, in assignments, if you have a non-electronic submission, when you go into put in grades, it shows, you know, 13 out of 13 submissions in the in slash new. So it made me think that it pretty much acts like it's been submitted from the moment the assignment is opened. Hmm. So I'm arguing that lessons should treat it that way, that if I have something that is requiring that a student submit an assignment and it's a non-electronic assignment, it should unlock instantly but the real power would be with the minimum score put in a require a minimum score for a non-electronic submission and it would unlock once the instructor puts in a score that is at least that minimum because hmm. right now if the assignment is not electronic a uh, less lessons will allow it to be set as a prerequisite for something but it will never ever ever unlock Oh, so it stays locked regardless. Mm -hmm. Forever. 
Uh, yeah, that doesn't seem it's right. A beautiful monkey wrench into some plans. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think your your suggestion makes perfect sense. I mean, if it is possible to select it as a prereq, there should be a way for it to unlock. Um, so, you know, it seems kind of silly to have a prereq that you can never unlock. So, yeah, it, I think it makes sense to have it work that way so that you could do the minimum score. What do others think? I see a plus one from Dee Dee. Is that a plus one on this or is that a plus one on something else? And I missed it. It's this, it's this. Okay. I think that Christina has it nailed um, and I agree. Yep, I'm here. I think this makes perfect sense. It should have been designed that way to begin with, Christina. <laughs> At least that's my opinion. I assumed it was until I ran headfirst into that brick wall. Yeah. All right, well, I think this sounds like a great uh, improvement. So I'll definitely note that when I go back and put some notes. Um, so it looks like Alan has finished researching the, um, the group thing, and it says it doesn't look like TAs have section info permission by default. So um, that would be a customization in the realms to give them that permission. But if they have that permission, then allowing the TA to be added by default when they create a group seems like a reasonable thing. For people that don't use it, I mean, you probably wouldn't give them that permission in the first place, so they would never even know that they had that ability. But if people are using it, it seems like it might be a shortcut. Other I agree a hundred percent. Yes. Yep. Yeah. All right. Cool. Other people can chime in. I'm not the only one talking. Yeah. On. Please join the party. Feel free. Um, let's see. I'll go back and update that later. Okay, good. And somebody, I, Dee Dee, I think, has been updating the notes. So thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, all right. So, Alan, do you want to go to one of yours now, or are you still looking into realms? Happy to do so, um, right. i.e. To, to talk about these other tickets. Um, by the way, you know, when we eventually talk about roles, there might mm -hmm. be some more granularity because they're literally all I'm seeing for section info or the the, the, the section tool. There's mm -hmm. only three. You know, you're either a section instructor, section TA, or section student. Um, so, <laughs> you know, I I think maybe, Didi, you might want to check the realm and see whether or not you've just made TAs. You know, I don't I don't know if the... I don't know how that permission has been set for y'all. Okie dokie. Um, but in any case, um, shall we go to the, the first one, which is more of just a heads up? That's okay. uh, 47932. And in this case, there is a situation where student names can be exposed to graders, even though the assignment has been listed as an anonymous assignment. Uh, in this situation, what, what happens is if a professor does an oopsie, uh, creates an assignment but doesn't mark it as an anonymous assignment in the beginning, student comes along and does a submission or does some activity. Professor catches their mistake. Oh, this needs to be anonymous. 
uh, sets it as anonymous, anything prior to that action, the names are exposed when grading um, in the legacy grader. Not in the new Sakai grader, but in the legacy so, grader. Yeah. So the new grader um, replaces it with anonymous? Yes. The new grader um, properly lists the, the situation, but the legacy grader, it looks like it doesn't dynamically update the, the name. It just writes it the one time. If it, you know, mm -hmm. whenever it was originally written, it stays static um, versus <clears throat> dynamically checking to see first, hey, is this anonymous? Oh, okay. Right. If, if yes, replace with anonymous. If not, replace with the existing name or whatever. So this is not action. This is more of like, hey, if, if your institution uses these anonymous, we have you know our, our school of law, and the school of law is very particular about anonymous grading because it's part of their entire handbook. It's part of their catalog. It's part of every kind of you know legal agreement basically with the student is that grading is supposed to be fully anonymous. Right. And so this does expose uh, student names. Um, and so the workaround here is like, make sure that the professor uses the new Sakai grader and not the legacy one, but a lot of folks prefer the legacy one, um, <laughs> just cause of comfort or whatever. So, um, so this is just a heads up. And if anybody wants to vote this one up to, you know, get some, a little development, love or action or what have you, I think that would be great. That's all I wanted to bring attention to this item. I wonder how difficult it would be to have the legacy grader dynamically check those IDs. I'm not a developer, I'm not sure, but I would imagine in that line of code, it would just be check the status somehow of the assignment. If the assignment is supposed to be anonymous, then place anonymous else, place the name as it exists or put the student's name. Right. I would hope it wouldn't be that complex or different. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems like it, but then again, I'm not a developer either. It might be. Right. Yeah. Often there's a lot of. You pull one thread and. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the, the whole, whole sweater's gone. <laughs> well, I've so. upvoted it and anyone else can as well. Um, I think it's a great idea. I do too. I think it should, you should check for that, but uh, see if we thank can you. get that Thank you. Thank you for your attention on this. Um, you know, sometimes uh, it feels like Jira is just kind of like go into a void every now and then. So just wanted <laughs> to bring attention to it. Well, thank you for bringing this one up and we'll definitely um, try to get it some love if possible. Anybody else have any thoughts on this one? All right, so let's move on to our next one from Alan, which the, is the, the next great one's book a combo. Admin. Yeah, ah, so okay. basically, you know, right now grading schemas can be added, but it's like a, um, uh, I think it's an XML or, or some other method that needs to be done that, you know, in our experience, only our hosting partner can, can do these things, right? Um, and so, uh, in the spirit of allowing, you know, somebody as, as a system administrator through administration workspace, um, you know, the, sh the short term would be allow people to change what it is, but long term was, I'm thinking there should be like a grading schema manager in the admin workspace so people can edit, uh, add and suggest a order for the grading schemes. Because um, right now, if anybody doesn't know, when a grading scheme is added, it's given like an arbitrary number. And so the default order for that drop down menu is not alphanumeric. The default menu for when you're selecting from gradebook settings, grading schema, that drop down is whatever ID number is in the database for that. So basically, uh, if you have letter grade school A, letter grade school B, letter grade school C, or whatever, you know, if you're doing custom 
schemas, uh, they may appear random because it's just in a numeric order. <laughs> um, and we, we have that in our institution right now because, you know, we've got, you know, some schools want A to start at a 93 and some schools want A to start at a 94 and, and, and some professors don't want to go in and, and edit. They just want to be able to choose something from the drop down. So we literally have three plus minus letter grades, one that says letter grades plus minus 95, one says 94 and one says 93. Um, and they all just happen in the ID order. So 94 might happen before 93, might happen after 95, and it just seems random. Um, so anyway, um, I'm thinking about a, yeah, it's not, it's not fun, Didi. <laughs> um, so I, I think it would be cool to have like a manager. And then obviously, logistically, it would be, um, you probably have options on how to deploy those schemas, right? Uh, new sites only, right? Or specific, um, uh, like a specific term, like, you know, let's say it needs to happen for the fall term, but you already created classes two weeks ago or something, right? But you want to be able to deploy it to the, the upcoming fall term. Um, uh, because you don't necessarily want to deploy it to every site. Um, but anyway, two cents. I think having a, uh, a way to see the existing schemes, to modify them for, to, to meet the goals, to duplicate an existing one so you could just modify it. For instance, if, if it's literally just one of like the A is now starting at a 93 versus a 94, not having to rebuild an entire schema, but be able to copy one and edit it and rename it, et cetera. And then specify the order of those, like the first one on the list should be this, and, and be able to mark which one is the default, which one should show up by default whenever people come into the gradebook to begin. So that's my pitch, and I, I, I just wanted to throw it out there because it's, it's, it's not a small little thing, but I think for uh, institutions adopting Sakai and also institutions that currently manage Sakai, um, this could be a helpful feature. So I open it up for any thoughts or feedback. I think it's a great idea. Um, it makes a lot of sense to me to be able to create, copy, edit, and, and sort of deploy those in whatever order or to whichever sites you would like to be able to have it in. Um, what do others think? I, I see a, a yes from Dee Dee. Um, looks like Christina's also in favor. Jennifer says this would be nice also. Yeah, there are quite a lot of folks that have custom grading schemas. So having an easier way to manage them within the UI would be pretty awesome. Manage name and order. Because if you have different ones for each school, for instance, each school might have one or two or something like that. So you could create a, you know. Right, uh, you could label them. That, that ed letter grade one, ed letter grade two, whatever it happens to be. But yeah, you, and you can organize them. So all of the same school stuff is together, not in some hodgepodge jamble that's, uh, you know, maybe you beg and moan with your, your hosting partner or your uh, uh, database admin to like somehow mod mock up or change the d IDs so that they, the <laughs> so they show up on. in the order. Yeah. <laughs> that, yeah, that's not fun be... for anybody, to be honest. Let's, let's just, yeah. you know. It's not like the, the database admins are really excited about doing that either. So, <laughs> And anything that appears just random to the end user is not a good thing. Right. Um, I mean, so. a short-term fix could be like make it alphanumeric, um, but that's not a long-term fix, right? That, that would at least cluster things that are named similarly together um, rather than just, you know, wherever they happen to be on the menu based on the order provided. Um, but um, I think this would be a, a nice feature to consider, perhaps in, in an even or odd year, depending on uh, the, de the development cycle. Right. Well, I'm in favor. And it sounds like everybody else who's chimed in 
is also liking this idea. So Absolutely. hopefully we can get some traction <laughs> on it. <laughs> Quick upload, everybody. <laughs> yep. Um, so I guess my next steps would be, because I wanted to get feedback first, is mm -hmm. um, what I could do next in the new year um, is maybe try to, to figure out some, you know, mock-ups of what an interface might look like and seek feedback, you know, offline or whatever from folks on um, whether the interface seems reasonable or, you know, maybe I'm forgetting something. So I, I could work on that in the new year is throwing yeah, some screenshots and, you know, something that would make it easier for a dev to kind of understand what they're doing rather than just context. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, you can get feedback through the list if you like, but if you also want to bring some mock-ups to this call and have us take a quick look at them at, at a, as a group and give you feedback, that would also be great. So um, just let us know whenever you have some mock-ups to review and we can put it on the agenda. Sounds good. Thank you, everyone, for your time. I appreciate that. All right. A couple of excellent ideas there for new enhancements. Um, and hopefully we can return to that one later to, to look at a little bit more. Um, so we have one more from uh, Christina, and I think we have just enough time to get through it, hopefully. So let's take a quick look at um, tests and quizzes, enable matching questions, select to randomize choice or match. So Christina, do you want to give us a quick recap? Sure. So the matching questions, you get a choice and a pair, a choice and a match pair. And the match is a letter and the choice is a number. The matches, the letters are randomized and the choices are not. So if an instructor is say doing a labeled image matching, they would need one that is, um, if you look at the two files I've attached, I show what it looks like if you have a image with numbers and an image with letters. With letters, because the letters are randomized and the numbers are not, to pick, you know, if you go back to the previous um, one, Wilma, you can see where I'm seeing the problem. Um, because the image has letters, if I wanted to say, you know, if I want to pick line L, it's going to be, you know, G from the drop down. Line I is letter A. Line C is letter B from the drop down. So it just, it makes. Yeah, that confuses me just looking at it. Yeah. <laughs> so the There's only too way, many different letters. The only way that the labeled image works with matching is if it has numbers. If you bounce to the next image, you can actually, it makes a lot more sense. Because now I've got line one is, you know, going to be E. There's not, there's only one letter and one number going on. So what I'm suggesting in here is instead of having it be automatically that the letters are randomized and the numbers are not, give the instructor a choice. If the instructor is doing sort of their own internal randomization, they can choose neither. If they're doing something where they can have it be in any order, they can randomize both from what they put in. If they're, you know, doing a labeled image with letters, then only randomize the numbers. If they're doing a labeled image with numbers, randomize the letters and not the numbers. I think that makes sense. It certainly would um, make the, the selection screen a little less confusing. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you could choose so, which but, ones to randomize or not. Involving Photoshop and relabeling images. Right, right. I see a double plus one from Dee Dee. <laughs> but it also too, I mean, it, it, I envision this possibly just being a series of check boxes or radio buttons in the matching question. You know, what do you want to randomize? Right. Nothing, letters, numbers, both. Right. But that it could 
you know, give instructors, you know, they want to randomize this half, but not that half. Right. It gives them more flexibility. It gives the instructor more control. I like it. All right, anybody else have any other thoughts on this one? If not, I'll just put that we looked at it and we like it. So it gets a big thumbs up from teaching and learning. <laughs> I will upvote. All right, excellent. Okay, well, it looks like we are just about out of time. Um, so let's see, we have a couple of items here in the parking lot. If you have other JIRAs that maybe you think of later, feel free to put them here. And what I usually do is I copy them over to the next meeting um, agenda. So if you think of something, um, feel free to list it there in between meetings. Or you can uh, you know, either email me or, or, or send it to me on Slack to add it to the next agenda. So if there's any topics that you want to put, feel free. And our next meeting will be on the um, 21st, I believe. Yes, our next meeting is the 21st, and we'll be doing the Sakaiger Escape Room activity. So if you didn't get a chance to play um, at the virtual conference, you'll get a chance to experience it um, during our, our meeting time. So hopefully you guys will join us for that, and it'll be a fun activity to kind of kick off the holiday season. So thanks, everybody, for joining us, and we will see you in a couple of weeks. Take Thank care. Thank you. And thanks again for changing the date. Much appreciated. Yeah, no problem. Hopefully we'll get a bigger group each time. <laughs> so that's always good. Glad you could join us on my own. Later. <laughs>